to a sound error video check with it. Yes. Because yeah. I see... No, I see. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was having some Zoom issues, but I will, you know. Yeah, he's back. We can start now. Watches. Okay, cool. Yeah. You are able to hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of the Deep Tech Club uh, founders, mentors, members, and the entire audience actually listening live via YouTube. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Professor Mohan Veer Sani to kick off the first workshop series on all about product market fit. And it's an initiative from our uh, NASCOM Deep Tech Club uh, team. I am Varchas and I represent the core team of NASCOM DTC. Uh, to grow as a true product nation and the vision that we have, which is to build world class from India, an initiative again from NASCOM, our product startups need to have a very clear idea about target markets, target audience segments, and the business value that they are delivering. And this helps in achieving sustainable growth and profitability. But how do great product companies do it and what does it take? So uh, this is something that we are all very uh, inquisitive and we want to listen from uh, leaders and thought leaders like Professor Mohan B. Sani. And I couldn't be more excited to have you, Professor uh, Mohan B. to share your experience and words of wisdom on building sustainable business models and world-class products. To give a very brief introduction about uh, Professor Sani, he does not need any detailed introduction, but he's a globally recognized scholar, teacher, mentor, consultant, speaker, and that list goes on. He's also uh, primarily the Associate Dean for Digital Innovation at Kellogg School of Management. And his speaking and consulting clients include Accenture, Adobe, AT&T, Boeing, Cisco, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the list is extremely long that I can take the entire hour. Uh, to cut short, um, uh, it's an honor, Professor, to have you. We welcome again. Uh, Professor Sony has always extended his support for NASCOM, and this time he actually agreed at a very short notice on a on a early Tuesday morning. So again, thanks so much, uh, Professor, from the entire uh, NASCOM DTC community. Uh, so this session will be for an hour. Uh, we'll have Professor speak about the topic for around thirty minutes, and we will leave it to you, Professor. And for the next 30 minutes, we'll open up for Q&A and a few select DTC founders and men uh, mentors can actually just raise your hands and then you know, we can make this interactive. Uh, I hope you know, this, this introduction was useful and uh, thanks so much, Professor, and over to you. I, guess, I guess some connectivity issue again. Okay. Let's wait for a minute. Okay. <laughs> so he's here. Okay. Hello, Professor. You're able to hear us? Okay. Doing some uh, setup. Yeah. yeah, my 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 my, my sorry, apologies for I don't know why Zoom is being um, so uncooperative this morning. But it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all, and uh, also I think um, really heartening to see sort of this next wave of innovation uh, coming out of India. That I'm so glad that NASCOM is. Uh, sort of sharpening his focus on uh, deep tech. I mean, I remember um, about probably three years ago, um, speaking in Bangalore at the product forum. So that was when sort of we were starting to talk about products, but now the next wave we're really talking about deep tech. Uh, so, and, um, so what I wanna sort of comment on is the challenges that you would face, particularly in the context of what we sort of broadly called deep tech companies because the challenges are different. Okay, again, same problem. For some reason he keeps dropping off from the system must be taking. Yes. Issue. Yeah, you can uh, suggest to professor to try it on his uh, mobile phone as well.
Is there a way we can? Um, yeah. uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try and join on another machine so that uh, because it's sure. maybe my, my computer. So give me a give me a second. I'll try to just make sure I'm connecting on another machine. Uh, I'll have parallel connections open to make sure that we're. Uh, uh, but anyway, let's 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 go on. If if it crashes, it it is coming back. That's the good news. So um, if you look at the waves of kind of the, the innovation that have been taking place in India, um, and I've been intimately involved with that whole entrepreneurial ecosystem for uh, 20 plus years, uh, you know, we had a uh, sort of wave of uh, innovation around the mid nineties onwards that was largely focused on uh, e-commerce. By the way, bef before that, uh, the technology companies that we had, of course, were focused on IT services, and business process outsourcing, right? So that was sort of the first wave. But the second wave was what we call the e-com e wave, uh, particularly as connectivity started to become uh, more prevalent in India, network uh, speeds grew, wireless adoption grew. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the result of that was the creation of the you know, flip cards and the Paytms and, you know, and the Olas of the world. Uh, perhaps then the next generation we saw was mobile apps. So actually Ola would probably be the next generation uh, but that was all focused on e-commerce, right? That was all really kind of focused on uh, literally sector by sector emulating what had been done in the United States and Europe and bringing that. So in fact, uh, I remember Okay, uh, maybe um, I think he will just switch his uh, computers now and then get back. Professor, you're able to get back? Okay. Uh, Professor, you're on mute. Yeah, my mom. So on a lighter note, the biggest challenge to deep tech is, you know, communication tech. And someone should fix the projector in the rooms. <laughs> Probably so from project, fixing projectors, it, it's now fixing, uh, you know, these yeah. applications. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we, uh, you know, we, we, we this, I don't know why we're having these connectivity issues, but uh, so, so we have data sort of coming in from sensors, from devices, from a whole variety of sources. So that now allows us to think about. Uh, business applications in, in a whole lot of new ways, right? So uh, whether it's ag tech or insure tech, I mean, think about insurance, what you can now do with telematics data that was not available to you before, you can actually monitor the driver behavior and so on. So sensors and devices is one leg of the stool. So then it is networks, right? So wired and wireless networks that allow us to transport the data. And the third is cloud, the cloud that allows us to actually do very large scale computations at a Maybe he has bandwidth issue. Maybe he can try switching off his video. I just got change and see. Oh, awesome. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like a bandwidth issue. Right? It just keeps dropping off. It's like a stability issue almost. Yeah, maybe on the phone may work better. Yeah. 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 yeah, the Zoom indicates uh, with some the, the network bars, it's actually, it's actually stable at least. Uh, for him in the recent uh, five minutes. We'll just let suggest him to- Yeah, yeah we'll, just, we'll just, we just have to deal with this. And I'm just, I, I don't, I, I- Professor, can you hear us? 
uh, can we suggest uh, you know uh, professor to move to the other uh, desktop or workstation yeah even so that's what that's what what just i really mobile will work in my case it is works right 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 yeah. Yeah. okay we will definitely suggest that mm -hmm. I'll be waiting. What's what's top of mind for everyone? <laughs> yeah, he's back. Yeah, that's really sorry about the connectivity issues. So they were so so. I was I was going to say that the technology companies, um, e-commerce companies, are what I would call superficial technology companies. They're not really. I just, uh, just suggest the mobile phone. I think what is yeah. Next time before he speaks, we have to tell him. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll I'll have to jump in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Metaverse Atul to answer your question. <laughs> I, I'll have to raise my hands. But yeah, yeah. But coming to the same point which someone made, I sorry, Come I in. don't remember so, that. Okay. Uh, Professor, um, would you want to try uh, your mobile? It, to see if yeah, let me works. let me let me try to do that. Um, just just give me a second. Okay? Sure, sure. So metaverse one. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, just a second. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, while we're waiting, uh, Professor Sani, we're just doing a pulse poll. Uh, what's top of mind for everyone? I heard one metaverse. Uh, you know, one one liner. Product market fit. <laughs> what <Yeah>. else? <laughs> I mean, I'm in a product market fit class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever you build doesn't matter. Product market fit. <laughs> the budget today. Budget was non event, right? Now it is budgets are non event. Someone was saying uh, if no negative in budget, that itself is a big positive. So it's just like that. No additional surcharges, taxes, especially corporate side. So yeah, well, they've given some good guidance on cryptos and stuff, which is hopefully paving the way for a much cleaner regulatory environment soon for blockchain deep tech startups. So, but yeah, one one more point uh, I was going to some of the messages. Digital currency is a different thing, what they are talking. It is nowhere close to the cryptocurrency. Digital currency is nothing but taking out the okay, crazy, physical what is available in the kitchen. Yes, yes, Professor. Yes. Okay. Yes. My, my apology, hopefully this works better. Okay. So I was going to, I was telling you the story of uh, this company called Illinois Superconductor, an example of what deep tech is and what are some of the challenges that we, that we might face. So this company had created a filter, a superconducting filter that goes into cellular base stations. And uh, because of its superior signal to noise ratio, uh, it was able to kind of extend the range of the cell towers significantly and was able to essentially uh, allow you to increase the capacity of your uh, base station. Okay, sounds like a really interesting technology. By the way, the the the, the improvement was almost hundred to one relative to the conventional filters. Here's the problem, though: these filters were uh, super cooled, right? Because superconductivity only happens at really really low temperatures, so they had to be kept in liquid nitrogen at minus two hundred degrees Celsius, and and uh, and there was a lot of uh, complexity in installation of these filters into the base stations. And particularly when they targeted the aftermarket, they had to really focus on companies that uh, that, that 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 really were uh, already running you know, cellular base stations, right? Service providers. And being able to rip out your filter was a huge risk. So this company struggled for almost 10 years to find the appropriate use case, to find the business model, to get adoption, and uh, and they required a lot of capital to string themselves along. And by the way, when they did finally uh, get the traction, they realized that the target market was not actually the uh, uh, urban markets because of cellular congestion, uh, congestion, but it was actually the rural market because uh, the filters allowed you to have a larger reach. So they got the target market wrong. They got the use case wrong. There were adoption problems. And, and ultimately, after about 15 years, the company uh, finally found its feet. So 
So let me sort of uh, articulate what are some of the challenges you would face in finding a sustainable business model for a deep tech company. First of all, there is a significant amount of time that the company will take in gestation, right? So your gestation period is longer. You know, the time that it takes to actually commercialize. And particularly, by the way, if you're working on fundamental, you know, technology like materials or the deeper applications of, 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 of AI, it takes a while for you to actually find a commercializable use case. By the way, a lot of times deep tech companies, technologies come out of universities. They come out of academia. You know, there's a company, for instance, that I've been helping in Northwestern. Uh, it's called Synode. They, what they've done is they, they use nanotechnology-based, you know, graphite. Uh, kind of uh, uh, based batteries, right? So it's basically a battery that is using nanotech uh, to greatly enhance the battery capacity. The battery capacity will be basically your cell phone will work for a year. However, a lot needs to be proven before they get to from lab to the to the industrial scale manufacturing and so on. So that's one problem with deep tech. Your runway is longer. Your gestation period is longer. What that therefore means is that it's 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 also sometimes not easy to find the right use case to find the right target market and you'll experiment a lot you know you'll start to sort of you're, you're there, there, and particularly uh, you know what are the target customers who are the people that you should be pursuing where is the the economics of your business going to be viable that is not an easy problem to solve so i find sometimes these the deep technology based companies will spend years wandering in the wilderness looking for the appropriate target market trying one vertical after another and uh, you know really until they find traction the third challenge that arises in the, in this context is the fact that you need more capital and you need patient capital venture capital the conventional venture capital is actually not a good source of financing for these companies at least in the early stages because the moment you bring a vc on board the moment you sort of take professional venture capital uh the clock starts ticking right and their patience is is, is limited in fact in many deep tech companies the period for until we get to sort of profitability and an ipo is longer than sometimes the venture funds the entire uh, life cycle, right? A venture fund needs to liquidate within 10 years. So you need to go to government, you need to go to, you know, get grants, you need to find, you know, investors who really understand and appreciate the the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the patient capital, right? So you'll have to think differently about, and also be, uh, in, and to the extent that you can keep your burn rates low, to the extent that you can experiment on a low cost basis and not bringing a lot of professional capital, you will be much better off. So, so these are some unique challenges that, that you might face uh, in the context of a deep tech company. So to build a sustainable business, to build a sustainable business model, what should we do, right? What should we, uh, so I'd say that the, 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 the first thing that you really need to do is to, to, to narrow your focus and find a target customer and a use case where the need is greatest, where the pain is greatest, where the pain point is greatest. So that is something that I think you need to start with. Um, you have to ask yourself the question, who are the customers for which the problem that I'm solving is basically a must have as opposed to nice to have? It's something that they will, and, 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 and by the way, if you ever have a choice between business B2C and B2B, always go B2B. Right, always go B two B because it's the B two B applications where within, within focused verticals where you will tend to find uh, more applicability and 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 more willingness to pay. You know, so let me share an example of this with you. If you remember Segway, Segway was the sort of personal transportation device. So when the Segway was created, the original found the founder Dean Kamen basically said that what we are going to do is revolutionize pedestrian transportation. We're going to actually have this in every, uh, 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 it's gonna be a horizontal market, it's gonna be a mass market, we're going to actually have uh, these, these segways everywhere. But it turns out that people are not willing in the consumer market to pay $5,000 for a personal transportation device, right? So that's not something that they are willing to pay for because it's a nice to have, it's not a must have. So Segway struggled for many years until they discovered that there are two use cases where people are willing to pay, and they're both B2B use cases. So one is tourism, right? And the other is public safety, so police. So that is where you're willing to pay the premium, and those are the right target markets. So it's very important for you to find a target market where the, the, the need is great, there is a budget, there is a willingness to pay, and that you can go after, and later you broaden. 
All right. So that is, you know, one, one thing you need to think carefully about. Uh, the other thing, as I said, is you need to think carefully about, you know, who are you going to raise money from and how are you going to actually grow the company and, uh, and move it along without actually compromising, uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your viability because it's going to take longer. It's going to take. Now that said, I think that India offers a huge potential for deep tech companies because our problems are so large and our market is so large. You know, so we have uh, so so consider sort of three areas that I think are are are, are in my view are huge. Uh, one is healthcare, and the second is you know financial services. Actually, four, and the third is learning. And the fourth is agriculture. So these are four domains or four markets where I see a tremendous amount of apl applicability. And you know, and the technologies that you might bring to bear are you know AI, machine learning, uh, that that start to think about building use cases in these markets. So I think that the opportunity is there, the talent is there, or you just have to think a little bit differently than you do for for a conventional uh, e-commerce company. So you can't learn from you know these companies you can't build a billion dollar valuation in in three years um and if you do you know it's going to be actually dangerous i'd say so so that is the perspective on what deep tech is what are some of the unique challenges where are the opportunities and how you should be thinking about it so by the way i'm going to i've just updated my zoom i'm going to make it make another attempt to go uh to my desktop let's see if it works but i'll keep this on standby if you can let me in then we can and by the way, this is very clear, Professor Sani. It's very good. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so, 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 so. Okay, so hopefully this will work, but I will always be available on standby on the mobile app. Uh, so that was my kind of the summary of the challenges, the nature of the problem, uh, the nature of the ecosystem. By the way, the other thing I, I just want, one thing that I didn't clarify, I wanted to say is also the ecosystem that we need uh, for uh, deep tech is different, right? The ecosystem includes academic institutions, it includes labs, it includes government in many cases, right? Because you need a different set of players to come together. And that ecosystem is something that NASCOM has to nurture. Is something that has to be built over time uh, because it is different from sort of the venture funded traditional approach. So if we are the nascent stages of creating those, 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 that, those ecosystem partners. And that is the convening role that I think that NASCOM can really play. Uh, so with that, let's open it up to questions and a discussion. And uh, I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Okay, so thanks so much, Professor. Um... Anyone can, uh, you know, raise your hands, or you can just unmute yourself and and uh, ask a question. Um, hello, Professor Sani. This is uh, Praveen. Uh, Hi, Praveen. I'm running a company called Exar, which is in the VR AR space. So very excited to hear your talk. I have one question. So we started our company very similar to uh, what you mentioned, um, yeah. which is in India, getting a lot of great support from government customers. Um, and I think now what we are doing is really transferring over to the, to the commercial side of things, enterprise side of things, both within India, as well as trying to go international, right? Um, and, and clearly it's, it's not straightforward. <laughs> Um, yeah. because in government, nobody asked me ROI ever. I did not even know what ROI meant actually or <laughs> till, till very late uh, uh, being a techie. Uh, what are the things that you feel um, are important when we try to make this shift, right? Uh, you know, crossing the chasm has its own uh, different inputs about that, but I, I wonder what you think uh, about this whole area yeah. uh, and anything you can talk about in terms of relevance of VR, AR for, for industrial sector, that will be lovely as well. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Praveen, great, great example, great sort of uh, uh, um, challenge that you're facing. And this AR, VR space, uh, you know, is, is a wonderful example of some of the mistakes that can be made by deep tech companies, right? So let me go back to Google Glass, for instance, right? So Google Glass was a device that Google created and... You know, the idea was that you could walk around with these sort of uh, glasses and uh, basically get connectivity and 
uh, and uh, you know access the internet on you and, and speak through voice and so on. Uh, there were two problems for me. One was it was never very clear what exactly you were going to do with these in the consumer lab, right? Uh, so you know it's and by the way it's fifteen hundred dollars. So yeah. so do I want to walk around after paying fifteen hundred dollars looking like a geek? And all I could do is take pictures of people through my voice, you know. That so that was kind of like so. Um, so this is one common, really common mistake is you go too broad. You go and try to address the mass market. There is no mass market. The mass market doesn't exist. So what Google should have done is actually focused on the enterprise. So now you have the picture of an oil rig behind you, right? So imagine that I'm doing a repair on a pipeline on an oil rig, and I need to call up the CAD drawing to figure out exactly how to sort of, you know, replace a part. Now, if I'm wearing these glasses on one side, I can bring up my SAP and the other side I can bring on my AutoCAD and be able to actually see the drawing while both my hands are free. That's a use case that makes sense. And Praveen, I can guarantee you somebody in ONGC sitting on that, that drill, that, that oil rig doesn't give a damn whether it costs $1,500 or $5,000 because it is a mission critical application. They will spend a lot of money. In the consumer realm, a lot of companies will build nice to have. And this is my problem with this whole metaverse hype. Right, so 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 the metaverse again. There's like you know, well, you could randomly wander in, and you could do this, and you could do that. Besides gaming, video gaming. I mean, some of the use cases are not as compelling. So my first recommendation to you would be squarely stay focused on the enterprise. Do not even think about consumers. Consumers don't want to pay for anything. So stay focused on the hour. This is just a fact. You know, we do we pay for Facebook? Do we pay for you know uh, for Twitter, for Instagram? It's all free, ad supported, right? So focus on the enterprise. Now in the enterprise, go deep into verticals and think about where are the most compelling applications, right? So for example, the biggest AR VR uh, uh, contract on the planet is Microsoft's deal, twenty billion dollar deal with the DOD, with the Defense Department. And that is basically helping the soldiers to visualize battlefields and to help them do training. So similarly, where can you think about deep compelling applications of training, of simulations? You know, so, so I think that, by, uh, that for, for example, uh, uh, industries, heavy industry might be an, 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 a useful, I was mentioning like oil and gas or, you know, or, or uh, uh, basically situations, Praveen, where Putting a human being into a real setting is dangerous for some reason. And therefore, being able to train through simulations is a safer way of experimenting. So that's one sort of sort of use cases, right? So oil and gas, chemicals, uh, uh, you know, so those sorts of applications. Uh, defense, as, as, as I pointed out, was another, but that's closer to government. Um, so focus on the enterprise. Within enterprise, find a few verticals. And within a few verticals, find a few lead customers. See, in the IBM Berlin used to have a program called Folk, first of a kind, where oh. they would actually go in and go in with Exxon Mobil or go in with one company and say, we're going to build this out with you. Because the other challenge with what you are doing is it's co-development, co-creation. Your customers are going to actually help you to build out the use case and application. So don't target a broad frontier, go deep, go narrow. Pick a few enterprise customers who are willing to partner with you to build out some of these. So I would say pick a couple of verticals, not more. And within a couple of verticals, pick a couple of accounts and then work with them very closely. That's when you'll visualize exactly what, because one of the challenges is as you go into these applications, there's a lot of domain expertise you need. Yeah. But I mean, recently I worked with a, uh, a team at Infosys that was doing building AI applications for oil and gas, right? So, you know, one problem that they focused on was called the stuck pipe problem. And the stuck pipe problem is when you drill a well and your pipe, you know, gets stuck uh, and then you lose production. So how do you, so there's actually a whole bunch of math that goes into predicting when your pipe's going to get stuck, what is the pressure and all that, all sorts of flows, Bernoulli principle, all those equations. Okay. So, so they actually, to build a machine learning model to predict when your pipe is going to get stuck, required them to deeply partner with an oil company you know, and, 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 and who Hello, uh, Professor, can you switch to mobile? 
Virchas, how long do we have him uh, on the call? Till nine. Till nine. Okay. Yeah, my suggestion, if you can go a few minutes over, you can sure. ask. All right, who's next? Okay, I'll go. Um, this yes, is Kaushik. Kaushik. Yeah. Uh, so we are in the ND counterfeit track and trace solution uh, space. So we've generated or created our own code, the patent is pending. So my, my, um, my question is, of course, we are now trying with the Indian market. We are seeing some inbound interest, uh, say from the Western markets as well. Uh, right? But having said that, how do we, we know the problem is used? There are companies offering even simpler solutions than what we are offering. And of course, the other end of the spectrum, there are really complex solutions that go in, as in passports, currency notes, and so on and so forth. Right? So how do you know that the product is right or the market is right, but both are wrong? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, right? So, the, so for any startup company to be successful, it has to achieve product market fit. Right, so that so, and then and, and achieving product market fit, Koshik, is an iterative discovery process, and 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 sometimes you have to change the product, and sometimes you have to change the target market until you find convergence. Right, so uh, so so in your case, you know, the issue is um, that if you look at anti counterfeit, I don't know the space well, but from what you are saying, it seems to me that there is a spectrum of complexity of the offering and therefore the complexity of the problem. So the product market fit problem in your context is what I would call appropriate complexity of your solution and price, of course, uh, to, 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 to relate to the problem. Right? So, uh, so I, I like to say, Koshi, that's that you can use a bazooka to open a can of peas, but maybe you just need a can opener, right? But on the other hand, if you're facing the Russian military, which Ukraine is, you need a bazooka. So you really have to sort of, uh, so you have to segment your customers. That is important. Segment your customers and use cases and look at, you know, the scale and the complexity of the problem that they're facing in counterfeiting. And then you have to make a judgment call. Are you going to be the Cadillac of enter counterfeiting? Or are you going to be the, you know, Maruti? Right. So what end do you want? And, and these, the, the demands are very different. The demand at the low end will be a zero touch, ease of use, convenience, easy onboarding, and it just does the basics, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you go to, I don't know, the Reserve Bank of India or somebody like you know, that, a very, very advanced customer, some of your, you know, uh, there the, the issues may be more complex, the functionality they need may be much more detailed, and, and you have to stay at the cutting edge of sort of, you know, entry counting, because this is a cat and mouse game, I assume that the counterfeiter is getting better and you have to get better. So that's a judgment call. What is right? I don't know. I don't know where the market is most attractive, right? But, you know, you can end up with a mistake on both ends. You can end up by creating an over-engineered and over-designed and too complex offering for people who don't need that complexity. On the other hand, you can end up with sort of a, uh, you know, product that is targeted at a simplistic, you know, simple customer, but the real opportunities in the sort of, you know, industrial scale, really high end. By the way, you might also find that you need a dual, dual track strategy, that you have a news light and a news enterprise version, right? So basically you have a lightweight product that really kind of is optimized for ease of use, where your distribution and channel strategies, zero touch, digital, you know, channels, no inside sales, no 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 field sales, but then you have the enterprise customers where you you know do strategic account management. So whether you end up with a dual track approach where you have a small business version and an enterprise version, or whether you focus on that industrial strength enterprise, or you focus on the SMB, and that's a judgment call based on what, where your market and where your opportunities. But the important thing is to match. Is, a middle ground is not a place. A to be middle there. ground is the value of death. Middle ground is the value of death, right? So middle ground may be uh, good for from uh, what Buddha told us, but you know this is not the middle path is not what you're looking for. You're looking for the extremes and uh, because then you're neither here nor there. So in your case, product market fit is the idea that I want the right feature set and the right level of complexity because you know, 
for some people who want just the basic, I'll, I'll give you an example from another context. I was working with CA a few years ago, Computer Associates, Koshik, and they had an API management product. So this API management product had been designed for the enterprise. And it was, you know, very feature rich, industrial strength, you know, a lot of sort of complex uh, configurability and diagnostics and dashboarding and so on. But then there's a new customer that was emerging, the app developer. The app developer on is, comes on AWS and just wants access to a very simple a API uh, and they don't need all of these bells and whistles. So, so in fact, as they added more and more complexity and more and more features to their API managing product, the product became even more irrelevant to that developer segment, the independent developer segment, right? So what is really important, the other thing you need to always keep in mind is, as I am building new features and functionality into my product, am I also building new value? New features don't necessarily mean new value. In fact, if it makes your product more difficult to use and to onboard and to learn and to implement and to deploy and to integrate, you're actually taking away value from somebody who wants the simplicity. So bottom line is really understand that customer base, understand that market, figure out what are the segments and then make a judgment call on what segments you want to pursue. And if you want to pursue multiple segments, you need a dual track product strategy. So that would be my, 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 my advice to you. Thank you, Professor. Gaurav? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Professor, I think uh, I loved your thought initially, what you mentioned uh, that you know for deep tech, the gestation period is more. And that's why I think there is a great need to focus you know, and see right. where exactly the value lies. Uh, and you further, you also mentioned about, you know, kind of focus on B2B rather than B2C because, you know, uh, B2C consume, consumers as such, you know, do not want to pay for anything, which is absolutely right, I think. Uh, but isn't it that I'm also feeling that in B2B, you need to have great partnerships. Right? Yes. So, for example, in case of Axel, right, how will the guy, you know, basically get to know the, you know, the, let's say the highest rank officer in the, who is running the big, uh, you know, rig over there to allow uh, in that company to experiment. See, Microsoft's and the IBM's of the world are different. They yes. are in multi-billion organizations, basically, who have access, you know, and who approve of themselves, they have the credibility and they have access to, you know, all the kind of, you know, big bigs in the industry. But a small guy who is still trying to prove the credibility as well as the technology, Right for them getting to have this B two B partnership, you know, with a big firm, uh, probably can be sometimes more challenging, you know, than finding consumers to experiment the technology and kind of you know and making sure that yeah you have learned enough from the experiment. Now you are big enough, which gives you some time in the market to sustain, right? And you know, basically then approach B two B in terms of productization and you know, kind of making money and all that. I think it's also one of your earlier speeches where you mentioned that, you know, service is a kind of, you know, for learning and then, it's, you know, basically yeah. product is to learn, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Think, and if you look B2C, that way it's for learning and then B2B is for making money and all that. I mean, just thoughts, you know, would love to hear your thoughts on that. So Gaurav, I have to tell you that um, it is, a, if you mix your B2B and B2C in a startup company, it is a deadly cocktail. Don't even try that. The DNA is different. The DNA for a B2B company is different from the DNA for a B2C company, right? I mean, so I do not agree that you can use consumers as a learning ground and then go to the enterprise. No. Rather, let me go back to what you said earlier, which is this idea of partnerships, uh, you know, building the B2B partnership. So, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of one com startup company that I was involved with. So these guys had built it was called a company called Firescope. And what they had done is they had built a uh, automated uh, IT asset management and uh, compliance uh, service. So essentially, this, this, this system would monitor all of your IT assets, monitor compliance in real time, and, and, and uh, basically make audit into a streaming audit where you're not doing audits on a batch process. It's basically continuous audit. Achha, aap uska customer kaun hai? Top insurance companies and top banks. 
Now you want to try to get an appointment with Jamie Diamond at at, at JP, JP Morgan Chase or the Chief Risk Officer for you know Bank of America. They're not going to give, give you time of day. The other problem, besides that, even if you do get an in, maybe you have a connection and so on, the risk of dealing with a startup company for a mission critical application like this is too high. They're going to tell you, oh, what happens if you guys go out of business tomorrow? This is like that Illinois superconductor. I go in and put in my filter into your base station, and then you say, okay, hey, I ran out of cash. You know, my company. So what, what am I going to do with my, my base station mission critical infrastructure is running on your system? So the risk is very high, right? So how do you mitigate that? So you know what these guys have done? They had a sales force and they were going and targeting these people, trying to get appointments and meetings with C-level officials in banking and financial insurance. It was very difficult. So then I asked them, I said, who has access to the C-suite in compliance? Who is constantly there with the C-suite? Accounting. SDI SD auditors. Right, the big four: EY, PwC, KPMG, you know, uh, uh, um, so and Deloitte. So these guys are in the boardroom all the time. So I said, and why don't you partner with EY and have them build this into their audit practice, and then say, listen, when we are going to do your audits, we are going to have this as a. So this is, by the way, what we call a white label strategy or a ingredient strategy, where you say so. Same thing. What Illinois Superconductor could have done is they could have gone to. Uh, Nokia or Ericsson and embedded their filter as an OEM product that is now sold as part of the initial sale as opposed to the aftermarket because aftermarket is going direct to customer. It's very challenging. But OEM, you could have now, of course, OEM is not easy either because you get pennies on the dollar, right? Because in this case, EY would have a lot of bargaining power. But that is a good place to start. So I call this God of the strategy OPC, other people's customers. Try to leverage through other people's customers. See, ask yourself who has access to that customer I'm trying to get to, and can I partner with them to get that initial traction? Once I do that, then I start to build the confidence and the faith, and I build my customer base. Then you can use a direct-to-customer strategy. So I would say that that white label or partnering, partner-driven channel strategy, go-to-market strategy, is a good crutch. But a crutch is not a leg. Once you learn how to walk, you throw the crutch away. But you need that to initially get started. So Absolutely. those are the approaches that I would take to find selective and interesting ways to kind of to, to, to gain entry, to mitigate these two problems. Nobody knows you and nobody trusts you, right? The risk is too high. So to mitigate that risk, you go in with a partner. Uh, by the way, in this context, I would say you mentioned Microsoft and, and Google and, and Salesforce. These folks also have... Um, you know, ecosystems that you can join, right? They are all very interested in promoting their platform. So I know that all of these companies have a very strong program to attract entrepreneurs. So if you promise that you're going to be on the Azure stack, you can get Azure credits, you can get, you know, funding, Microsoft Ventures and so on. So you can partner with these platform companies early on. I mean, let me give you an example of Geo, right? Where I'm on the board. You know, we have probably made, 20 to 25 acquisitions in the past couple of years. And a lot of them are deep tech companies. They're very interested in specific domains of AI and machine learning, whether it's haptic systems or imbibe or blah, blah, blah. In all of those cases, what we tell them is, listen, what is your problem? You don't have customers. We'll give you access to 400 million customers. We'll give you the initial capital and you run your company, become part of our ecosystem. So we now have an ecosystem of 25 plus deep tech startups that we are working with and we, we are literally doing an acquisition a month. Uh, so that is Akash's full-time job is really to find new, new, new investment opportunities. But there again, we want the entrepreneurs to thrive, but take away some of those barriers that I can't get access to customers. I need technology, I need data. I mean, it's like, here's our data lake, 400 million customers, 180 attributes per customer, go play with it, right? And now you plug in your e-learning solution or your healthcare solution into it. It suddenly, is, it, it knocks years off your, I'll go to market. So I would say also consider partnerships with the platform companies, right? Whether it's a Microsoft, a Google, or an Amazon, or a Salesforce, or a Geo, you know, because they are also very interested in growing this entrepreneurial ecosystem for that, for to promote their platforms. Sure, awesome. Right. Thanks, I think Jimmy, uh, you're next. Jimmy, uh, yeah, hi, Professor. Yeah. Um, uh, so great speech. Uh, so a little brief about us. Uh, we are a platform on Voice AI. And um, you know we initially. Ah, apna, apna, apna value proposition. I can, I can, I can read it. Yeah. You know, so, increase yeah, digital uh, sales, uh, automate contact center operation, enhance customer experience. Yeah, thanks. I love thanks. it. There's nothing like a guy who's selling all the time. I love right. it. <laughs> yeah. So we we actually narrowed down on uh, 
on two verticals, uh, insurance and banking, as well as on use cases. You know, right. and, and that too, like in insurance, we went to a level of that, you know, our strengths have been in distribution. And when we started to a lot of insurance customers, we realized that there are pain problems in, in claims as well. There are pain problems in, you know, in other areas of the same vertical. And we started working and building on, you know, more use cases in right. same vertical. So slowly what happened is, you know, after one and a half years, we believe that we have found our sweet spots in, in two verticals, you know, those use cases of distribution. We have started speaking the same language a lot. You know, you talked about the domain expertise mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, we focused on one horizontal of contact center automation as well. So that's quite horizontal. But lately, you know, we had started getting immediately a lot of traction in 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 AI on edge and, and healthcare right, right. And, and things like that. You know, so few more verticals are, are spanning in and, you know, those are too lucrative and kind of too tempting to get into. So, you know, after you, my question was, you know, after you typically get this some initial product market fits, in some verticals use cases, you know, you get tempted to broaden your your market, right? And you know, so what what are your some of the suggestions while doing that? Do's and don'ts, you know, to kind of be careful. You know, there's there's a fear of getting too broad, and and uh, on right. other side, it's also important to kind of you know broaden the market as well. So some of the do's and don'ts on yeah. while doing that. So uh, Jimmy, this is the problem I've given a lot of thought to. And, and actually there's an article, I wrote an article a few years ago, you can find it on LinkedIn. It was called the paradox of scaling. And the paradox of scaling, I talk about some of the challenges that you face as you grow the company and how you need to actually, um, let's see, it's frozen. Uh, yeah, and, and, and how you need to think about um, your customers differently as you grow and scale. So let me first tell you a, a, a don't story, right? So I was on the board for of EXL. You probably know EXL because they're in this space, right? They might be a target customer for you because they do insurance and a lot of... So I was on their board for 10 years. And, uh, and we said... Uh, uh, so they said, basically, uh, when we started growing, um, they had... So we said, we need verticals. So, they, so Jimmy, they say... So I said, uh, we should focus on verticals. So they came back and said, we are in five verticals. I said, how did this Insurance was 65%, but they had one customer in logistics and transportation. We had one customer in retail and one customer in airlines. And there were three verticals. I said, that is, hey, by the way, I tell you, if you have five verticals, you're horizontal. You know, it's, 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 and this is a, uh, there was this movie, oh, Disney ki movie, Up. Usme, you know, it's like squirrel, 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 right? So that's how opportunities will pop up. You have to stay focused. So you cannot, for a company of your size, if you tell me you have more than two verticals you're focused on, I will be extremely skeptical. So these opportunities may arise, they will come, but don't disabuse of yourself of the notion that going into a vertical requires domain expertise, it requires a dedicated sales organization, it requires a very specific understanding of the use case. And it is not easy to, to sort of, you know, to go. So, so you're saying you're in insurance and even, by the way, Fast forward to EXL now. EXL is a billion dollars in revenue, about three, four billion in, 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 in valuation. They still only do three vert verticals, right? So they have insurance, banking, or a BFSI, and healthcare, right? And, 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 and then they do analytics as a, as a horizontal, just like you're doing contact set. No more than that. So, so moving into, let's take healthcare, for instance, Jimmy. Healthcare is, it's a huge market but it's also a market littered with graveyards of startups that try to do, particularly if you try to do the US market. HIPAA compliance, the complexities of the organization, the institutional complexity is huge. Maybe it's a little simpler in India where you don't have such complex you know, regulatory constraints, but healthcare is extremely specialized. You cannot dabble in healthcare. You go in and you decide I'm di diving deep in. You, you know, so uh, so be very careful of what I'd call superficial vertical. That is an oxymoron. Superficial vertical. Vertical equals deep. Vertical doesn't equal broad, doesn't equal superficial. So, uh, so I would say, so let me tell you one thing that you should remember. If you have a choice between going broad and going deep, always choose deep. And secondly, no market is too small enough, is, is too small if you go deep enough. And, 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 and actually, let me tell you a story of a company that I advised there in the Bay Area. It's called Sama Technologies. Suresh Kata is the founder. 
So Suresh came to me a few years ago. It's sort of an interesting story. He said, Miracle, let me take you to lunch. I have a growth problem. So we went to this Indian buffet in Devon Street, right? It's a $10 buffet. This is relevant. The $10 price point is relevant. So he told me, I said, what do you do? He said, we do analytics. I said, for whom? He said, for everybody. I said, yeah, problem. Man. If you say you're solving a problem for everybody, you're solving a problem for no, you know. So, so let me give you a tongue twister. If you are trying to be everything to everybody, you are everything to nobody. So you have a choice between being everything to somebody or something to everybody. But if you're something to everybody, you're everything to nobody. So what you want to do is to pick a subset and be everything to them. So I said analytics, he said, we have this platform called Fluid Analytics Engine, and then you can build industry applications on it. I said, koi platform make karita. People don't buy platform for lunch, they buy solution. So you say, I have a platform, the problem is that I still have to build the end solution. I said, who are your, what are your verticals? He said, we do healthcare, we do insurance, we do life sciences, we do this. And he started describing the use cases. I said, this is all generic, Suresh. But when he started to talk about Life sciences, he said, we are able to accelerate clinical trials by a year. We can knock a year off clinical trials. I said, wait, wait, wait. That is very interesting. I said, bus, sab kuch band kar do. stop everything else. Just focus on life sciences. So between healthcare, insurance, and life sciences, I said, stop the two. With, within, insure, within life sciences, I said, don't do med tech. Don't do biotech, only focus on pharma. I said, within pharma, you have large pharma, mid pharma, small pharma. Small pharma, not big enough. Large pharma thinks they've got it solved, go to mid-sized pharma. Suresh said, you're killing me. My TAM is now one-tenth of what I started out with. My market opportunity is one-tenth. I said, but that was vanity TAM. That's fake TAM. You don't have a right to win. So you saying, I have a trillion dollar addressable market. Thank you very much. You know, it's tough, but there's really not an addressable market. So to his credit, he took my advice and he built something called LSAC, Life Sciences Analytics Cloud, totally focused on clinical trial operations. He emailed me last year. He said, by the way, we've grown 50% CAGR for the last four years. Our valuation has quadrupled and Carlyle just put $430 million into that company. And then his next, his, his last sentence, his email was, when, I can, when can I take you to lunch again? I said, Isbar paise lagenge, you know? So, so that $10 price point was relevant. So take your professor to lunch, by the way, it might help. <laughs> I think there's a story uh, here. Professor, I'd like to just interject on the... Uh, specific use case that you mentioned yeah. if you are a horizontal platform like say zoom is right. it is applic- you're not doing specific customization for anyone you're just making a solution available is it still necessary to go deep and select one set no no see there are some products that are purely horizontal that are i mean the iphone right the zoom you know or microsoft office so so these are but these have been built over time and you know and they have evolved into a mass market when you're starting out, I would still say that, and by the way, Zoom got lucky because everybody had a live streaming problem, right? But even there, you know, funnily, Kaushik, now I would recommend to Zoom, start specializing, start building, because what is Zoom's biggest weakness? Microsoft will kill them in two years. I can guarantee you that because Zoom is an island because now Microsoft says, listen, I can have messaging and collaboration and live streaming and Active Directory and all of that in one space, plus the power of AI to monitor engagement and so on. Because Zoom, the problem is transactional. After I finish this meeting, I have no idea who you people were. I have no record of the chat. By the way, Zoom has just introduced persistent chat. So they're starting to look at. So, uh, so they actually now need to build out a, a EDU specific Zoom that's specialized, an enterprise focused version that does you know hardware and software because Microsoft is moving in that direction with Teams and Teams rooms. So, uh, so I think that to maintain yourself in the market, you still need to be careful as focused competitors start to emerge. Uh, you need to kind of continue to revisit your value proposition. Otherwise, uh, uh, so I, uh, I say Zoom's days are numbered if they don't really figure out. So the prediction I will make is that in the next year or two, Zoom gets sold. Maybe Salesforce will buy them, you know, because Microsoft is relentless. I've worked with them for 20 years. I know those people really well. Teams sucked. Teams still sucks. I tell the people in the team's organization, but they will get it right ultimately. Once they get it right, that bundling proposition is so strong. And simple, look at us, Koshik. At Northwestern, we pay $800,000 a year for our Zoom license. Teams, we already have it for free. We have an enterprise license. So Microsoft will just come to us and say, why are you paying for Zoom? You know, just use Teams. So no, so no, no, you can't, you can't be, 
you know, horizontal and get away. The only people who've done that, bless their, God bless their soul is Apple. Right? Okay. Apple okay. never worried about enterprise ever. Apple never worried about B2B. They never ever had a B2B strategy, but they make a product that everybody wants and they create a user experience that everybody desires. And that's what gets them their $3 trillion. But I think they are literally an exception to the rule. They prove the rule by exception. You cannot be an Apple. You know, it's very, very rare. Uh, Professor, is it okay that we just extend for another 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, okay sure, sure, sure. No okay, problem. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Dilip? Yeah. Uh, you can make it a little short. We have 10 minutes and then we try no to... No problem. Up other. Thanks. No problem, Thanks. no problem. Uh, Professor, thank you. Thanks for the uh, great lecture. Uh, I, I I know you've covered a, quite a bit of, uh, you know, the uh, answers to some of the questions that I have, but, you know, we have a we have a very similar problem like you know most of most of them spoke about we have a situation where we we are a data intelligence company so we, uh, i run a company called zscore we are a data intelligence company and we built uh we built a platform on top of which we provide verticalized solutions specific for you know particular verticals and uh uh, the journey led us in such a way that we built our, all the customers that we got were initially from the insurance sector, predominantly health insurance. Right. Um, we've, we've given them quite a bit of savings, you know, uh, both in India and Australia, we were able to give our customers more than $30 million in savings wow. from their claims and everything. It was all validated, approved by them, but very few of them converted. They were, I mean, I don't know if COVID was one of the reasons, but very few of them converted and they were ready to take a $10 billion hit. Okay. And, and after that, you know, one thing led to another. Now we have a series of companies who want to, uh, you know, we went white labeling our solution and a series of companies now are interested in white labeling. But the problem is that they're, they're going away from uh, insurance. We have people who are in, interested in insurance, but there are people in manufacturing, then there's somebody who's very interested in the banking sector. Okay. So uh, how do we actually isolate or uh, target that particular, understand which is that second uh, industry that we select? Because if both of them seem very, uh, very good. And as a startup, we really want to get sure, make sure that we, you know, get going. Yeah, I, I mean, two, two, two recommendations for you, Dilip. One is that um, something doesn't add up in the story that you told about, no, that there was not, they were not converting. Dig deeper into that. What is the reason? Because you seem to have had a compelling value proposition with demonstrated economic outcomes. So there is something missing in that investigation picture. I'm not, you know, you need to get to the root of that problem. Maybe it's the wrong companies in the sense that their leadership team isn't willing to make the investments or the commitment, in which case you need to go to other insurance companies. Maybe it's something to do with your uh, onboarding process and the way that you do change management or implementation, you know, so you, you need to find out the reason because uh, that is your crown jewel. And before you kind of look elsewhere, figure out how to mine that space and what has gone wrong. So I would go back to those companies that didn't convert and, and ask them, can I just speak with you? Can I just try to find out, kya ho gaya? was it us? Was it you? What was, what, you know, was it COVID? See, you you just threw out a hypothesis at me, Dilip. You said, maybe it's COVID. Are you? Find out, yeah. This is your life and death. So you need Actually, to we did. To a large extent, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, in one of the cases, the entire... Uh, chain right from the managing director till the program manager. Everybody left that that department. See, that's what I told you. So that is the, that is not you. That is basically <laughs> see in many. By the way, this is a warning I'll give to anybody who's focused on the enterprise. Enterprises you have to build. You know that when I remember in biology, we have to study. There are two types of plants: tap root and fibrous root. Tap root goes deep down. Fibrous root goes like this. If you're a, if you build a tap root into an enterprise, where you are very vulnerable. One guy leaves and the whole thing is gone. Build a fibrous route, right? Go into the enterprise, have multiple points of connection, build multiple relationships so that you are more stable. Uh, so that you are, because the biggest problem you'll face in the enterprise market is you have a champion, you have a big supporter, or well, he leaves, he or she leaves, and then you're finished. So if you so you need to broaden and deepen your connections inside your key accounts to make sure that you are you're insulated from that turnover. So so that's, you know, I won't, I don't know what the hypothesis is, but you need to investigate, you need to figure out because I really think that if you have a good use case, if you have demonstrated potential, dig deeper there, right? 
Now, second part of your question is what else? I would say be opportunistic. It's okay. Because, you know, we used to play that game when we were children, hot, not hot, blind man's buff, we used to call it. So what, every time you go to a customer, whether you get a yes or no from the market is a data point. It's telling you, how did you discover insurance? Because, you know, you got 10 customers. When you look back, say, Are, out of 10 customers, six are insurance companies. So I declare myself to be in the insurance vertical. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. Because you're doing market discovery. So similarly now, supposing you say manufacturing, I'm getting this, you know, by the way, I really think the universe only sends you weak signals of opportunity. You have to amplify them and say, other opportunity here. So be opportunistic. But then what you want to do is to pick one, one more, and, 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 and then go deeper there. Now, as far as white labeling, white labeling might give you the opportunity to pursue other verticals because you don't have to build up the sales and go to market organization. But even there, don't spread yourself too thin. Because to me, a white label that's, an, uh, that's a blind alley is not worth it. You know, TK, you'll make some money in the short run, but a white label that is a stepping stone to building a DTC strategy is what you want to do. And therefore, don't white label into vertical that you don't think you're going to ultimately deepen the pursuit in, right? So, okay. so I would say pick one more based on where sort of the, you're getting traction and where you can build the partnerships. Uh, but please go back and figure out why those people didn't convert because there's Absolutely. something you can fix there and, you know, go back to that. And by the way, the COVID situation is also changing now. You know, people are sort of coming out of their bunkers. So, you know, you might have, you might find a different market response if you go back to those customers now or similar. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Professor. Uh, Prajwal? Hey, hi. Uh, so, hi, Professor. So, on the business model front, there's always been a confusion confusion from the start for me. Uh, so I run a startup which is basically into the secure Delby space where we have built these physical devices which allow us to securely transport anything uh, within two hours on bikes. Uh, so this is bridging the gap between your hyperlocal or Delby companies which don't have anything, uh, uh, any sort of security versus you have your armored trucks which basically carry your jewelry and other for, uh, other products uh, with thermal trucks and gunmen, etc. Uh, so we're bridging the gap through technology IoT devices. So now the pr biggest problem for me is, first of all, if I'm building the Delvey network, there's, there are other challenges like trust and um, yeah. like establishing um, the entire supply chain uh, at scale for this thing. Whereas on the other hand, we're getting a lot of interest from um, existing businesses um, who have their entire fleet, but then they need more visibility on that. So they're asking for our devices and then there are other logistics companies approaching we've already established scale who want to like, you know, implement this at 10,000 devices scale. So now I'm really struggling as to which uh, path to go down under because now if we have to scale on our own, uh, like, you know, there are a lot more things that we need to do, but then it will, uh, we'll still be able to cater to a lot more customers and then you're building a supply chain. But on the other hand, if you're giving your devices to these guys, you're limiting um, your access to the market depending on where they are. Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts on this? Like, do we need to take a call? So the way I'm looking at it is we're doing both and then we're trying to figure out where we'll fit best. But I know that's a bad idea from the start when we're doing it. Uh, so, but then I don't want to make one this bad decision, go down, uh, pick one path. And then maybe if that's wrong, uh, we're back to square one a few months later. So um, any thoughts on this and um, how do you approach uh, such decisions where you are at? Yeah, well, you, you, in effect, you, your, your answer is, is in your question. So right. you see, if you use a partner, because in this, uh, in, in your business, the big challenge is scaling up that, 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 that supply chain and the distribution, the, you know, the, the, the it's just it, go back to the days when Flipkart was founded and they were, they couldn't find a logistics company. You know, my student was running the marketplace and he said, you know, we went to UPS, we went to DHL and Blue Dart. They said, no market in e-commerce. So Flipkart had to bloody hire 20,000 people to deliver packages. Today, right. you would right. never do that, right? Today, you would go to a company like Delivery right. uh, or, 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 or now, because even the Indian Postal Service will deliver and right. so on. So you right. have much more of a partner-centric strategy. So I think that similarly, you can take a two-phased approach. Initially, I would say uh, focus on the product, because when you talk about secure delivery and the right. devices, you really need to make make sure that that is industrial strength. Right. Don't focus on logistics and then the channel as much because that is, uh, it's 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 sort of you know it's an infinite sink. There's a lot of money needed 
And, 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 and by the way, if you don't perfect the product before you scale it, you know, I, I say fix before you scale. So right. that is also a bad idea. But in the long run, you perhaps want to build that out yourself. So I would say rely on partners to reach uh, scale initially. Make sure your product is perfected. Make sure the solution, make sure differentiation and, and you become better known. Then you can ditch them and, you know, build a more direct to, uh, strategy. Because uh, if you even look at your investors, I think they'll be less interested in, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting in money to build out the product functionality versus building out distribution because also my quote, you know that's that's relatively commoditized you know your key you know figure out your competitive advantage your key is that you built something that is uh, it's just secure and by the way security as you know is a cat and mouse game the functionality needs to keep evolving the threats keep evolving so just staying abreast of that and making sure you have the best solution in the market will occupy most of your time. And that's where your money should be spent initially. But later on, as it, as, as your reach grows, you can consider a direct strategy. Got it. Okay, so Thank it's a two-phase approach. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All maybe right. the last question. Rupa, more, so, uh, just one so. more. Uh, you know, Maybe we have some three, four minutes. We'll just take one more. Rupak. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. So, Professor... Uh, the... Yeah, value propositions So I know exactly what he does now. Yeah. So uh, uh, we are into the HR tech space, and uh, you mentioned about OPC, which is other people's customers. And we've recently experimented with tapping on to some placement agencies, and right. Right. they are ultimately taking our product to their customers, and we are finding good traction. So one. Is that something we need? We should build on. Number two, you mentioned that um, in a deep tech company, particularly uh, getting investment from VCs, etc., uh, may not be the right strategy. So, therefore, would say a corporate funding or a corporate wanting to invest in your company be something which we should look at. So, these are my two questions. Yeah, good, good, good questions. Um, I, I, I think that. Uh, um, in your case, actually, I think it is important to build out a direct-to-customer strategy because there's a lot of learning and you have an opportunity. And by the way, this also answers the second question in the following way. Go to people factories, Rupak. Go to Infosys, go to TCS. You know, go to people who have, like, I mean, look at Infosys, right? 240,000 employees. They interview a million people every quarter. So unke saath partner karo with their with, with their venture organization and build out. So you only need two, three customers. Go to WNS, go to Genpat, go to EXL, go to, you know, because there are these are people factories, right? I mean, how many people at TCS have? 300,000. So if you can a partner with them to say, we're going to build this out for your HR organization, then your channel st strategy is done. And by the way, this may also address your first question. These companies all have venture arms. So they may be interested in putting up in you know some some early capital, but the one risk you run there is that if you take investment from a TCS, then you won't be able to do Wipro, you won't be able to do Info because then you'll you know so uh, so be careful of getting strategic investment too early. By the way, uh, don't get me wrong, I did not say VC money is bad or not possible. You just need different type of VC. You need yeah. somebody who understands this is going to take time, is patient capital and so on. So there are the right, and to the extent that you can carry on with angels, carry on with, you know, friends and family, first is your own money, then it's friends and family, then it's angels. The longer you can extend that before you get the first professional investor in, by the way, even a strategic investor is a professional investor, the better it is. So bootstrap is as long as you can. And I would say that in your case, that white label strategy is okay, but us may be the the problem is you'll be sort of one step removed from getting the customer insight. So uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, like look at a company like McDonald's. They have two million people, and they and they hundred percent turnover, which means I have to inter I have to recruit two more million people every year just to stay on the level. So unke liye, this is all. Uh, the only thing is that if you partner with one of the really tech savvy company like Infosys. Uh, right? so, the, so be be careful about sort of that. Uh, it's 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 uh, so keep something up your sleeve. Don't tell them the whole story. So we have recently done some work for Nokri Group, and they are looking at us 
that if this is successful, maybe they'll want to roll it out for all their customers. And that is, I think that's a parallel strategy that you should follow. But, uh, you know, funnily, there is a company I work with called VMark, you know, they're there. And then many, many years ago, they had a partnership with, they also are in this smart interviewing space and they use AI to do, but more in the resume. Uh, and now they're doing interviewing too. Uh, they were doing this deal with Nokri and at the last minute, Nokri shafted them and uh, they wanted some anti-dilution, blah, 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 some other things. And it was so that the deal got killed at the last second. That's the other thing you have to be really careful about. I don't know who's in charge of Nokri now, but uh, find out what they did with VMark five, six years ago. They really treated them very badly. So, uh, you know, that's just a personal experience I have with the Nokri, Nokri group. So, uh, so there, uh, at that time, it really felt to me, I was an advisor to VMark. So it's, it felt like what they were doing was unethical. They kind of changed the game on them in the last minute. So be careful because your negotiating power with respect to these people is quite low. So they can take advantage of you. So be, uh, be cautious. Uh, I, I, I personally believe that companies like Infosys are more ethical than uh, some of the, you, you know, I, you guys are all ethical, but there are some startup companies that cut corners on ethics. So you be be careful who you partner with. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Atal. All right. Okay, folks. So this is, uh, I hope you found this useful. My, my apologies for the Zoom. Uh, I figured out what the reason was. I've come to my office after a long time and the version of Zoom that I had when I started off was not updated. So after it updated, we are okay. But uh, my apologies for that. But I hope you found this useful. And, uh, and I think that, you know, you guys are all doing some phenomenal work. This is, this is the, this is the, this is what we want out of India. We want the next Google or the next Microsoft to come out of India, not the next, you know, e-commerce this and e-commerce that. So, oh yeah, that story is over. Now do some real stuff, real technology for real business applications. And, and I'd say that in deep tech, 80% of the companies are going to be B2B, right? So, so that, that, that is where, you know, you really need to understand the enterprise, understand the channel strategy understand sort of you know what the uh that's vertical market to water market strategies are so i uh, hopefully this has been a, a helpful conversation so if you have any more specific uh, questions or concerns feel free to catch me on email okay thank you so much folks and uh, thank you thanks. professor have a great day thanks thanks so much thank you professor. professor thank you so much sir okay bye thank you professor bye, -bye. thank you great job arches Hey, thanks, Neil.